Hey everybody, uh, this discussion today is about policy making, how we take uh, the social problems that we've been talking about and try to find solutions to them in the form of policy. We can look at uh, how we address the issue, for example, of, of racial policing and the, the violence against black and brown bodies historically that's been a part of policing in this moment where we want to change that. We just don't sort of snap our fingers and change it. There has to be policies made and enacted by politicians. That's kind of their job. And so we're going to look at the role of social science in making these policy changes and finding solutions to problems. Now, it's important to point out that we don't ever completely solve a problem. We had a lot of policies about poverty in the 1960s under Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty, and we still have poverty. Uh, it reduced some of the causes of poverty, and that was important. We can have policies about gun control. It's not going to completely eliminate gun violence, but it might reduce gun violence and save a few lives. So the idea of policy is you're not completely solving a problem, but you're addressing the problem and finding ways to reduce the harm because of that problem. So policy is never a panacea or a cure-all of any problem, but it's a way of addressing the problem. And so sort of social scientists see sort of three roles in this issue about policy making. The first is, um, when we think of how social scientists play a role, is to evaluate a policy that already exists. Um, to look at a policy that's in place to address homelessness or to address health inequities uh, and see if it's actually effective. Is it meeting its goals? What are the goals? The goals are to reduce poverty. So let's do some measures to see if poverty is decreased because of this policy. Uh, and to look at the effectiveness and see if there, you know, if it works, there may be an opportunity to expand this law. If things work, right? We know, for example, that some of the policies to reduce bullying have worked. Uh, after Columbine in 1999, we changed some of the policy, the school policies about how we deal with bullies in school, and that has been largely effective. So it starts uh, in schools, high schools, and then it goes to middle schools, and then it goes to other places outside of places like Colorado where the Columbine shooting happened, and we, we find what works. We can do the research on what works and expand it. Uh, the research can also suggest policy. The sort of second role that social scientists play is coming up with the policy in the first place. If we, for example, know that there is a link between the lack of employment for people coming out of prison and their recidivism rate, uh, there's some research that backs it up. Hey, let's have a policy that tries to find jobs for people coming out of prison. And again, this is one of the reasons Oregon has such a low recidivism rate is that we have actually done this work to try to find employment for people coming out of prison so they don't re reform. So the second way is that we can use research to come up with policy. So you might remember the notion of A has an impact on B, and if we want to change B, let's change A. So the policy would be about changing A to have an impact on B. And then the third sort of policy role is that we serve, social scientists, we serve as critics. What's wrong with the policies that we have? What are they missing? How are they not uh, taking into account important variables? How might they be, might be making things worse? Um, for example, you know, some of the policies about mass incarceration, social scientists have said you're actually making things worse by disrupting, for example, urban black communities. Um, and so we can work as critics. So often when we're thinking about uh, appealing to the policy makers, and we'll just call them the politicians, appealing to the politicians, they want, we, you know, we generally, social scientists, think about how we can increase the use of research and decision making. You know, how can we get them to think more about social research? Or, you know, let's get them to read the journals, or let's let, get them to consult uh, academics who are doing this research. But sometimes that falls on deaf ears because there is a two different worlds, the world, of the world of politics and the world of social research. We're interested in science and what works and the facts. Uh, they're often interested in getting reelected. So we want to really sort of reframe that research notion and think about instead, um, how, can we, how can we make wiser decisions and in, under what social conditions might social research help? So instead of coming in like, here we come to save the day, we want to you know, give you all the good research so you can develop policy, you might better say, hey, let's make smart decisions, and there may be times when research helps. And so that's kind of the sort of sneaking in the back door. Um, in doing this, there are some things that we have to recognize when we are thinking about social science and, and policy. One is recognizing good science from bad science. And we do a lot of this work when we're talking about our methodologies, when we're talking about uh, do we have an 
accurate sample that reflects our population? Is it representative? Um, one of the big things that people get hung up on um, in looking at social research is the difference between correlation and causation. This is sort of our mantra in social science. Correlation is not causation. What do I mean by that? That you may have uh, variables that seem connected. For example, the crime rate goes up in the summer. So the temp time of year and crime rate are correlated. Crime rate goes up in the summer, comes down in the winter. They're correlated. They're not necessarily causal. It's not like summer in itself causes um, crime. It's what happens in the summer. For example, kids are out of school. Uh, it's hot. People are drinking more. There's less supervision of young people because school is out. Uh, people are kind of in a, you know, um, agitated state when the weather gets really hot as opposed to when it gets really cold. In fact, we're reading about in Ansel about the, the heat wave in Chicago in 1995. And one of the things the city did because of the incredible number of deaths to, um, stem this this killer heat wave that killed more people than were killed in 9-11 uh, was um, pay for air conditioning, window box air conditioning, you know those units that you put in the window because a lot of these people, especially elderly people, were living in apartments by themselves and dying in their apartments. And so that was done primarily to stop the deaths that were heat related, but what it also did is it dropped the crime rate down in Chicago in the summer of 95 because instead of being outside and sweating, you were inside chilling with your AC. So we want to make sure that uh, we don't mix up correlation and causation. Because the idea, again, if A is correlated with B and A has an impact on B, then you can have a policy. But if they're just correlated in what we would call a spurious correlation, you know, also in the summer, ice cream eating goes up. So ice cream eating and crime are correlated. Do we reduce crime by stopping people from eating ice cream? It, it doesn't make any sense. So we have to be really clear that there is a causal connection. So that's the, one of the first things we think about when we think about evaluating science. Another thing we think about is how we um, disaggregate the data. And what do I mean by that? There are, um, we love the average case. Social scientists love to look at the correlation line. Most, most people who get a, a four-year degree make a significant amount of money more and their lifetime income, call it four-year degrees, it greatly produce, um, pr produce good incomes, right? I mean, that's one of the reasons a lot of people go to college is so they can make more money in their life. Um, that's, that's generally true. It's not always true. There are some times when people get a lot of education and they don't make any money at all. And there are some people, Carly Jenner, who have no education and make tons of money. So we want to be able to look at uh, sort of all the cases. And this is where the discussion about intersectionality comes in. I wish we had more time to talk about this, but intersectionality is really going to look at some of those kind of in-between cases. So, for example, we could talk about um, being black in America, and we could talk about being gay in America, and the experiences of being black and being gay in America. But often when we do that, we miss out the experience of being black and gay. There's a different experience there. Uh, and there's a different experience for men and different spirits for win, women who are black and gay. And also a different experience for men and women based on the social class that they're in. So we want to be able to kind of look at the whole picture. We just don't want to cater to what the average case is. Based on the average case, this is what the policy suggests. Well, what about the people that are, I'm trying to draw a pie chart here. <laughs> you know, you've got like the Pac-Man pie chart. Well, here's the majority of the cases. But what about the people that are in the Pac-Man's mouth? You know, we have to make sure that a policy addresses those folks as well. So uh, in the interest of having good science to develop policy, we, we develop a kind of progressive guide to social science and policy. And let me just sort of kind of go through these main points very briefly about what this progressive guide looks like. Um, these are the things that we w really want to keep in mind when we're using social science for policy. Um, we want to have a moral component. We want to call for policies and behaviors that enhance our moral obligation to our community, to our neighbors, including children. Uh, and that includes people who think differently than us. You know, we want policy that helps people who are conservative and liberal and everybody else. Uh, so the first thing is to have a moral component that policy is supposed to help people, not hurt people, kind of like a, a doctor's model to do no harm. Uh, we want to uh, look at policy or, or call for government programs that help people who don't have a lot of resources 
uh, on their own, that, we, that people who can't help themselves. So policy really has to be focused on sort of the, the disempowered and the marginalized people. This is, again, a progressive guide. Uh, we want to have a, the third one is we want to have a, a special commitment to kids. Children are at risk in many different ways, including with regards to health inequities, with regards to education imbalances, uh, violence, violence in the home. Uh, so we want to really put children at the front of the policies. How do we best help kid, cause we, kids? Because we know there's a ripple effect when you don't help children. Um, how can we leverage all the incredible resources we have in this country um, to help people who are in urban and rural areas in economically disadvantaged situations? So the poor. How do we take all this wealth that we have uh, and create policies that help the poor in rural and urban areas? Um, and then the last one is recognizing that some policies are going to make the most sense administered on a local level. Uh, They're going to focus on a rural area like Appalachia or an urban area like Detroit. And, you know, those places might have specific needs. But there are also going to be policies that need to be organized and financed and administered on a federal level. So it's up to us to kind of help guide who actually has the jurisdiction to put the policy into place. Is this something that needs to be dealt with on a Portland level, on a Washington County level, on an Oregon level, or on a federal government level? So everything sort of works. Um, so one of the examples of this we've seen has been the, the, poli the varying policies around uh, marijuana legalization. You have states that have recreational marijuana as legal, Oregon. You have states that have medical marijuana as legal, and you have states, especially in the Deep South, where there, there ain't no marijuana that's legal. Uh, and it's created an imbalance. Um, but the argument initially was places like Oregon have the infrastructure to kind of deal with it in a way that states like South Carolina don't. And so at the initial phases of it, it was felt that it should be a state level policy. And now, because of some of those imbalances between some of the states, we are now looking at federal policy around marijuana legalization. So um, one of the things that, you know, when we talk about these problems, and this is sort of the um, mantra of a class like this, is um, it's complicated. <laughs> these problems are complicated. It's not A causing B. It's a whole host of variables that are very complex and, and, are, and are rooted in the context of the time and place. So, for example, talking about uh, racial inequities in healthcare is different in 2020 because of the COVID pan pandemic. So we have to understand the complexity of these problems, and therefore the policy has to address the complexity. It's not going to be a one-size-fits-all policy that says, okay, just you know, teach kids math and all your problems will be solved. We're going to have to understand complex systems and the fact there may be policy policies that have to have an impact on education, have an impact on healthcare, have an impact on the criminal justice system, on small business loans, understanding the complexity of these systems and then policy instead of a simple policy, we just do this and we solve the problem, uh, have to address this and understand um, micro level interactions, including social psychology of, of people involved in the case, as well as the sy dynamics of the systems themselves, how they are working with it with other system and you can't sort of fix one system in a vacuum you have to kind of address these systems in, in total so for, for example think about the racial conflict in america think about how complex that is it isn't one thing it has to do with you know the institutional systems the trauma that's been endured for for generations it has to do with culture it has to do with sort of all kinds of lack of access to wealth uh, the people of color have been disenfranchised from, and so the, the policy has to look at these complexities. Um, so, so the first thing is that you know we want to respect science, we want to respect the social science when you look at sort of how it works, but we want to look at the scope of the problem. So, understanding the um, complexity issue is sort of looking at four levels that policy, the best policies are going to take into consideration, even though if they don't name them in the policy. The first one, obviously, is the institutional. We, we have to address the inequities in our social institutions, whether it's school or the prison system or policing or healthcare or the media uh, or religion. We kind of find ways addressing the problems within the specific institution. How does education solve the fact that there's a higher 
dropout rate for Latino kids, for example, Latinx kids. So we work on the institution, but we also have to work on the cultural level. The cultural level is, you know, how we organize ourselves. What are our cultural values? How can we have policy that helps bring people together and make clear what our values are uh, and also break through the bubble? So policies that encourage diversity, for example, that help people sort of cross-pollinate with their different cultural and experienced backgrounds, um, having workplaces that have policies that kind of break up the notion that on five o'clock everybody sort of separates. Uh, we want to be able to have people mix it up. I always use food there as an option because people always like to try and sample food from other cultures. Uh, on the personal level, the third level is on the personal level, how we work on these issues in terms of our own internalized uh, biases. How do we address issues like microaggression or internalized white supremacy? You know, some of these things that have been there when people say racism has been solved, it's usually white people who are talking about some civil rights laws that were, were passed in the 1960s and it didn't do anything to change the culture and it certainly didn't do anything to change our internal socialization. So working on those policies that work on that, including policies that train police around issues like implicit bias, that's a big one. Policies that have people in the workplace have to engage in some type of diversity education. Um, there's a lot of private businesses and government agencies that are reading white fragility right now as part of the policy around diversity issues within their institution. Uh, and then we think about this sort of on the global scale. You know, how much of this plays out on the global level, especially when we're talking about issues like immigration, how much of this is tied into things that are happening in other cultures, uh, how we saw, for example, the, the, the policy of NAFTA that was signed by Bill Clinton impact undocumented immigration coming from uh, Latin America. You know, so we have to look at the, the kind of global element of these policies and the connection of the global to the local. You know, I always thought it was very interesting that there were so many Michoacaners, people from the state of Michoacan in Portland, and I thought it was just... There was a secret out in Michoacan that Portland is the place to be. And then it turns out the migration, the emigration from Michoacan, Mexico to America in general, not just Portland, had to do with NAFTA policies. Um, so we want to be able to address these issues on these four levels. And so, again, when we are addressing these policies, we want to recognize power imbalances where people have been disadvantaged by policy and, and try to develop policies that recognize the power balances that have been institutionalized. We want to um, recognize that some of this is going to be resisted by the, the power establishment, by the status quo that doesn't want us to address the power imbalances because it's good to be the king. So there is going to be a natural resistance to policy that challenges power. Uh, but we want to utilize social science uh, based on the evidence that it provides that things work. So there's a lot of research around evidence-based policy or evidence-based approach, which means we've got some good, hard social science, not bad social science, but good social science that says some of these things work. Um, and, you know, some of this policy is not going to work, right? Some of it, the war on poverty, some people would argue was a horrible failure. Poverty actually went up in the 1970s after the war on poverty. Uh, but the question then is, what if nobody tried to solve these social problems? What if we didn't have any policy? What if we just let things happen and just blame everything on the individual? So these, these solutions to these problems that we've been addressing this quarter are cumulative efforts of a lot of people working in different areas and sometimes on separate pieces of a very complex problem. They may be working on the, the micro personal level they're working on implicit bias, for example. They may be working on the institutional level. We need a law or we need a, a policy at Nike that does this. Um, they may be working on the cultural level. You know, just let's focus on how we interact with our neighbors. Uh, but all these move us towards addressing these problems, not solving them, but addressing these problems. So what I challenge you and what we've done in this class is to take some of those messages about, you know, what are the root causes of these problems and think about how they can be turned into policy that addresses the problems. All right. That's a super short, short little uh, idea, a little mini lecture about how we use social science to create policy and make the world a better place. All right. Little discussion question is coming up in two seconds. Thanks.